Thanks so much. Good morning. So I'm on East Coast time, so I'm at least three hours ahead of you. And since I get up every morning at 5 o'clock, um, I'm probably many, many hours ahead of you all. So I'm about ready for lunch. Um, but I walk around when I talk, and um, I really want to to talk about something that's really important to me personally and has driven my career from the days when I was in graduate school. And I used to sneak out of my organic chemistry lab over to the business school at Sloan because I was fascinated by how the things we're inventing were going to get used. And that has in some way, shape, or form always driven my career and was what caused me uh, three years ago when um, I got this phone message, will you take a call from the Secretary of Energy? I don't know about the rest of you, but I had never gotten a call from the cabinet level person before. So I was like, yeah, sure, I guess we can talk. Hmm, not sure what that was. Um, maybe, maybe it's Steve. Um, but, um, but the idea that we could create an agency um, modeled on DARPA for whom the idea of taking really big swings for the fences was the table stakes. At the same time, looking to figure out how are we going to get those technologies into the marketplace. And it was too good an idea to pass up. And so I gave up a perfectly good job in the, in the private sector to come to government for a limited amount of time. Um, if you meet folks from RPE, um, they tend to be urgent, talk fast, and very focused because we all come in for three years. And so you get a very limited opportunity um, to try to move forward a piece of what you believe will change the world. And so we spend a lot of time at RPE talking about if it works, will it matter? At RPE, you'll very rarely um, find people talking about will it work? We figure you better try it. And we're not the study agency, we're the do agency. So before we could study it, we could probably have three or four cycles of learning done about whether or not it worked and have decided if we're gonna stop, start, or accelerate what we're doing. And so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today, is what's our model, and what are some examples, including some here in Oregon, that have um, started to manifest what is a five-and-a-half-year-old um, startup of an agency. Um, our mission formally is to catalyze and develop transformational energy technologies that will help us reduce energy imports, reduce energy emissions, and improve energy efficiency while maintaining the U.S. technological lead in energy technologies. And so it's a really wide mission. Pretty much anything in energy could fit in that space. So what matters is how do you do it? Um, so a lot of people will ask, and hopefully we can have a conversation in a few minutes, well, how does RPE decide what to fund? And the first thing we look at is does it have an impact on that mission? And so generally, pretty low bar, sure, it's energy in. But then it's the idea of, is it transformational? So we're not Office of Science. We're not trying to demonstrate scientific first principles. Like the ink may still be wet on those principles, but we're willing to work with those. We're also not the applied offices, many of which you've partnered with um, here in the Northwest to move really great energy technologies forward. We sit at that fuzzy interface between the impossible and the plausible, and hopefully the inevitable and trying to figure out how do you take things and pitch an idea that has been parsed differently than in the past so that we don't hit our heads up against the same constraints. So if we take one that I'm not gonna talk about an example, but the idea that for, for getting energy from plants, we fight millions of years of genetically modifying those plants themselves to be more plant-like in order to get them to be more fuel-like. So why can't we just genetically modify them to be more fuel-like in the first place. Like, why fight all that? And so we took the idea of, could you port the traits of algae into tobacco plants? So that tobacco, which already has a supply chain, already probably could use a new market, um, into an energy crop. And if you do the, the, the financials of that, sure enough, at certain concentrations and extractables, um, you could get tobacco to be a very valid energy crop. Or could you port the traits um, over to um, Lollip Lolly Pine, which is very operative in the southwest, um, ubiquitous in the, in the southeast, um, so that you could take what are the 7% terpene components and take them up to above 20, so you could have tappable pine forests. So you won't have the cellulosic issue anymore. Maybe you'll have a forest fire issue, but I don't, I don't know, right? Like up front, is that a good or bad idea? I don't know, but we should at least know, is it possible, and then figure out how do we deal with those constraints because the minute you shift the problem, you bring new ideas to the table. 
And our goal always is to bring new ideas to the problem, because the problems in energy are not new, right? I mean, so far I haven't heard of anybody, at least not credibly, um, proposing totally new fields of energy, right? We're trying to parse problems in new and different ways so that we get new and better answers. And I think that's what I was seeing as I walked through um, the hallway um, this morning. So what do we do once we figure out um, you know, what we're gonna work on? We spend a lot of time focusing on this though. I think it's anybody who sits in a tech transfer office um, at their university or has spoken to them or at the national labs or in companies. The idea that ideas to the marketplace is a low yield process is a very big frustration for all of us. And so we talked about it at RP. We said, well, what happens? Why, why is that true? And if we generalize very, very broadly into three buckets, things generally fail because you have the wrong team or the inadequate team, and that might be the in-close team or the extended network of team. You have an insufficient definition of value, and much as we all would love to define the value of our product, just like the, you know, the intelligence of our children by ourselves, the world defines those things, right? The world gets to decide the value, but how do we understand it? How do we influence it? Um, and how do we speak to it so that others come along with our view of the importance and, uh, and, and assign value? Or we have poor implementation, right? Um, I actually don't believe in technology success and market failure. It's a failure if it didn't get to market. So whether we you know, got a good idea and we didn't get it to market correctly or we missed something along the way, it's a failure. But we talked about at RPE, we have a very unique structure. When we give someone money, um, they may not love this, but we come to your office, right, Rita? We come to your office and say, here's the money, and we'd like to talk about exactly what we're all going to do together for the next three years. Every money comes with strings. Ours happens to be us. So, um, but in that conversation, what we want to talk about is not just the technology development and the milestones through those three years of time. Generally, our awards are three year, three million dollars. About half of our awardees are led by academics, about a third are small businesses, and about 20% are large companies, national labs, or nonprofits. But when we come in, we have a conversation, what's gonna happen about the technology, and then we say, well, what happens at month 37? What happens at the end of this award? How do we make sure that this doesn't just end as a very nice, we're all friends and we learn some things together? How do we make sure as best as possible, that this thing gets a chance to keep going and make it. And that's part of what ARPA is challenged with. We're very early in the pipe. We're taking things we certainly, people would believe, are impossible, and we gotta get them to a faraway energy future. So if we don't focus first on month 37, then we're surely doomed for failure. And we come back and we say, well, if you wanted to license your technology or you wanna spin it out into a startup, or you think it's gonna need more research because it's really early, well, what do we need to know to be compelling to someone in order to take that next step with you? So you're probably gonna need something to show them, but you're not gonna need it on month 36 minus a half a month. You're probably gonna need it six to nine months in advance. So in order to have that ready six to nine months in advance, what would go in it? Well, we probably need something that talks about your product and your technical attributes, but we probably might need something to talk about value. And you need a list of who you're gonna to talk to so then we walk back in time and we say, okay, well then, six to nine months before that, we probably need some kind of a cost model, because generally energy technologies, they worry about cost. It's a shame, but they do. Um, so what do we need? What do we have? It's like, oh, well, I don't have anything. I have my idea, so how am I gonna do a cost model? That's really odd. But it's like, well, we gotta do something, because with none, they won't even talk to us. So we say, well, let's, let's get out, I don't know, the Aldrich catalog or whatever you use in engineering to, you know, let's, let's bill materials and start with that tomorrow morning because you're gonna make decisions as you start to run your experimental design. You're gonna start to think about things and maybe some piece of it should be which thing's most important to you and maybe we should do some sensitivities. So all of a sudden we have activities that have to take place right now very urgently, right along with that technology that are gonna help us be successful three years from now. And that's part of what we do with this model. And the way we look at it is that RPE, we've changed the model. We're not just focused on, we're not focused at all on my pointer, but all right, you're gonna have to go with me here. We're not focused just on the top arc, which is gonna get us our advanced technology. 
but we're focused on this bottom part of the arc, right? This, this underpinning, what I call the knowledge and the networks, right? In your market, what's the market all about today? Because in energy, we have a lot of entrenched markets. And so you could disrupt it, but if you're going to go out and slay the giant, you should know the giant. Um, and we should understand how do people play together. And for me, markets are not pie charts. I'm very unimpressed with pie charts. They tend to be very deceptive and simplistic because generally speaking, what I want to know is how do the people in those supply chains play together today? Is the supply chain concentrated, right? Is, like in the automotive sector, how do they work? If I'm talking to BMW, but I'm talking to Ford supply chain, I should not be surprised that I got different answers, which is great, as long as I know that I'm speaking to two different things, and I shouldn't be, be attaching those. Um, do small companies exist at all? I applaud you for being the first small company in the supply chain that has none, but understand that you will be the first, and there's certain challenges. Um, how do people work? Are licenses important? Is, um, is intellectual property ownership important? Are the incumbents embracing of new technology or not? Do they tend to wait till it develops and buy up the, the smaller companies around them? You need to know those types of things, right? Not just how big the market is, um, but how it actually works. Um, you need to understand what techno-economics are important, right? Um, when I was at Kleiner, I saw thousands, thousands of uh, pitches where somebody had the world's greatest anode. I hate to pick on anode guys, but, but um, it was super, except the requiring rest of system, balance of system, would be prohibitive. And so what do I do with that? Nothing, right? If you're a venture person, you delete it or send a nice note, depending on who you are. Um, but but, you, but it's important, right? So I have to be able to say, well, who, how do I think about this? What else do I need to know? How do I, how do I assuage those issues um, that I might be facing? And then I think of we have to talk about the skill and resources for the individuals in the team in order to implement. Sometimes those skills and resources are as simple as knowing about that pitch deck. Sometimes it's things about understanding licenses or if, you're gonna, if you've always gotten con um, grants from the DOE, and you want to go work with defense, you really better understand that those two things are very, very different. The world of defense procurement is not for the faint of heart, but there are resources that can help you move from here to there. And so we run webinars for folks where we bring in nonprofits who that's their specialty. They actually will team with small companies to help them with the procurement process on DOD, um, telling your story, how to actually do that pitch deck, elevator pitches, um, understanding, heck, understanding the difference between um, debt and equity financing, right? Things that, as very, very intelligent members of the community um, of technologists, nobody, we never took that, right? We never understood those things. And so how do we help people get their arms around some of those things in a timely manner? And then the third most important piece of our puzzle is stakeholder engagement. So we actually map for every area. If we run a funding opportunity in concentrated solar or um, automotive electric vehicle charging or rare earth magnets and motors, we actually map who matters. Or my plant example. Is it regulated? Generally in energy, yes. But who, who regulates? When would they need to be involved? What would they need to know? And do we have knowledge of them? Do we have relationships about their needs? Um, who is the customer? Who's the buyer of our technology? Who defines the value? Often those are not the same people. Again, important to know. Um, who makes the decision about what's going to get procured? And then we look at that, and as an agency, as well as with our awardees, we figure out, well, what types of relationships are important? Is there something as an agency we can do? Like in the ca case of our natural gas program for passenger vehicles, we recognize that if people helped us build charging stations for at-home charging of natural gas vehicles, that the specifications were not going to, current ones, were not going to allow those things to exist. So we actually brought together a consortium of the awardees with an association to look at changing those specifications. Now up front, I don't even know if any of them are going to succeed. But to let them succeed and then have them fail because I didn't address that need up front would be, in my mind, negligent, right? I wouldn't do it if I was in business, so why should I do it just as a funder? So we try to identify what should happen at the project level and what should happen at the program level and how and why do we move these people forward. And that's why I adore what you're doing here because then you have to get people together. And so 
the, the conversations and the seeing what is possible, right? In, in innovation, the path between you and the market is not straight, unfortunately, again. But often, by talking to enough people, you might identify people who see a first market for you, or your inverter technology may solve a problem they're having, and you move forward in this discontinuous manner, but you're moving forward. And so being able to talk about what you're doing and to a large group of people is a lot of what we spend our time worrying about. We host a very large summit, 2,500 people in DC every year. The sole goal of that, every one of our awardees has booths, um, is to actually get those conversations going and we push the envelope with making people aware of what's going on out there. Um, we fund technologies that compete against each other. So if we pick a space we fund, we'll fund 10 or 12 different technology approaches. Because I actually don't care which one wins, right? I want the best ones to move forward and we need to know what's happening in this innovation space. We'll try to make it as open as possible and then look at how do we pull those things forward. And we've been surprised. Um, we've been surprised about what's succeeded and we've been surprised about what's failed. Um, both ways, right? The, the, the things we really were, I was, I, I would have been wrong many times, my program directors will remind me. I'll be like, really, we're gonna fund this? And um, I'll show you one in a minute that I was not excited about up front, but, um, but it's pretty damn cool. Um, so this is what we do. This is what we do every day, and, um, and if we're successful, and for RPE, success is handoffs to the next step. Ultimately, all that matters is if products are in the marketplace making a difference in the world. But in the short term, um, we have to be able to say, are things moving to the next step? Are they spinning out startup companies? We've had 24. Are things partnering with other government agencies, part of DOE, part of DOD? We have probably, probably almost a couple dozen of those now. Um, do we have internal development by larger companies or, or startups that existed before they came to us? We're getting more and more of those every day I hear about more. Those are a little fuzzier. Large companies don't want to often talk about stuff that they're keeping internal and bringing forward. Um, and then we do follow, follow, follow on funding as well, which is only a piece. Um, venture has declined in the space, but we're fortunate. Um, 21 projects we invested $95 million in have garnered well over $625 million in follow-on funding. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a piece of our metrics and, um, and something we're quite proud of. And so, rather than speak in the abstract, let me just show you some of the things that we've been working on. And, um, and so, I mentioned um, we parse our world into transportation and stationary. We work a lot in transportation, competing everything from electric vehicle technology, um, could you use natural gas for passenger vehicles, um, to natural gas conversion to liquid fuels, um, to traditional motor technologies. And so one of the ones um, that's been interesting has been um, a project, APEI, Arkansas Power Electronics, uh, based in Arkansas. Um, if it's not obvious, this is, um, this is the actual battery pack in the back of a Toyota hybrid and a plug-in hybrid with those three battery packs there. The piece up above it um, would not be there in a commercial vehicle, but it was the only place they could get it to go. That is actually the charger for the electric vehicle. In the traditional Prius, uh, uh, Prius today, the pack's probably about that big. And um, this was a silicon carbide um, technology development by Arkansas Power Electronics um, that they went after um, much faster um, frequency um, changes, much lower cooling needs, and much higher power. And so they were able to shrink the design for all those reasons. They had less need for cooling fins, um, they were able to charge faster and with more power to a factor of 10. And so this was a partnership that came together from the very beginning of the project, um, but does show you what's possible. So, uh, you know, the ability to shrink some of these things and what's a very, very important sector of, of the um, developing um, electric vehicle sector of the economy. Um, another area we have gone after is nat gas for passenger vehicles. And it's not that natural gas for passenger vehicles is unknown, right? In many parts of the world, um, there's a lot of natural gas used even in passenger vehicles. But all those vehicles have no trunk. We didn't think that would probably go over well with the U.S. consumer. So we said, okay, but what has to be true for natural gas to be used in passenger vehicles? You'd have to have conformable tanks. So our whole, our whole idea that tanks are tanks and they're cylinders and that's how you hold gas. Um, would have to be changed. We'd need conformable tanks, just like we do for liquid fuels. 
Um, we'd probably need some adsorbents to get the pressure up high enough, and we'd need a charging system. And so we've had a number of interesting approaches. Um, this is one here from other lab after the tank. Um, so this is their intestinal design. Um, going after the idea that you could pressurize each of these individual tubes and in doing so in a compressed space that would be conformable based on the configuration of those tubes, you'd be able to conform this tank. And sure enough, you can. They have uh, met the targets for the burst pressure and uh, pressure holding that we wanted to see. And so flipping um, to the other approach here about, well, how do you get the gas on board? I mentioned that the, you could have a charging station you know, at your home. And uh, we certainly have folks like GE who've gone out and talked about how they're going to go develop that idea. But I thought that since I was here in Oregon, I would introduce the um, Onboard Dynamics uh, startup, which this is actually part of the team. Uh, Rita, who's here this morning, sent me this photo. And I realized yesterday as I was leaving, I was like, but Rita's not in the photo. I guess when you get to send the photo, you decide who gets to be in it. But this is actually um, an onboard um, compression system where they could tell you much, much more than I would, and they'll get it right. But they're actually using the engine itself to compress the gas. So you would not need that at-home compression system, right? So this whole idea of how do we change the paradigm about what happens and how it happens really opens up, again, new challenges, new constraints, and new opportunities. So we're very excited about this project. Um, our team from RPE is actually going down to meet with the team tomorrow. Um, this project started at Oregon State. Um, with Chris's team two years ago? Two years ago, and um, is now moved to a startup. And so, again, one of those um, you know, types of ideas of how do we move this forward? And uh, you can ask them about what it's like to work with us. Um, but it's been a really, really fun project. We're very, very proud of this. Uh, if we think about storage in other ways, um, Primus Power, this is going to grid level storage. Primus Power is based in. California, um, one of our projects funded back uh, three or four years ago. They're now an alumni. Um, they just sent out a note. They're going to unveil their pods next week, I believe it is. Um, this is actually a metal flow battery system. They've partnered with Raytheon at Miramar um, uh, Marine Base to um, demonstrate a fully operable grid, solar panels on two buildings, to give them 72 hours of power. Um, they recognized at the base when there was the power outage in Southern California that despite all the solar panels, they didn't have any power. And, uh, and so from a not just resiliency for 72 hours without the power grid being up, but also from load balancing um, types, typical types of grid level storage. So we're excited about their movement forward, um, a very good startup that's, um, that's been really making some good progress. I think they're doing some demonstration as well up in the San Juan Islands um, this fall. Um, but not all of our stuff, like if you look at this, it all looks like, well, it might be kind of close to being commercial. Um, on the other side of flow batteries, we have um, a project that just published in, um, in science about an all organic flow battery. So most batteries, metal technology. Um, this is actually um, Mike Aziz's group at Harvard um, that, in, that took basically the quinones out of rhubarb and demonstrated that those actually have the properties to allow you to do um, flow battery. So talk about changing the paradigm that the metals are not necessarily needed. Um, at about six weeks, eight weeks after they published, um, USC also published um, similar results in a similar quinone-based battery. And so I love it. It's like breaking the four-minute mile. It's like, well, everybody can do this now. So it'll be obvious soon that quinones are the next big battery. Um, but that's the piece, is right? Well, now there's challenges. Um, we certainly, we actually don't, we don't have the other electrode fully developed here. But there's movement forward, and that's the type of thing. It could be the tip of the iceberg kind of development. Who knows where it'll go? And that's the exciting piece that we get involved in every day. Um, off to carbon capture, right? We've done things there. Typical carbon capture um, usually uses a means to capture the CO2 from a flue gas stream. Um, ATK, if you've ever heard of them, is a defense contractor. They, they um, do a lot of things in um, aerospace, jet engine technology. And one of the things when you're developing thrust and jet engines, you used oscillating nozzle technology. You converge and diverge the stream um, to get thrust. You worry a lot when you do that that you don't actually solidify the components of your air because it'll blow your engine apart. So they know a lot about not doing that. So when we parse the challenge of new ways to think about carbon capture that would be low capex, low chemicals, they were like, well, we can do this. And so they took their technology and demonstrated with the similar converging, diverging um, 
nozzle design, that that's actually CO2 from a flue gas stream being solidified out, and then you'd collect it in a, um, in a cyclone separator. And so they actually just got a grant from NETL, the National um, Energy Technology Lab, through um, fossil energy to take this to the next scale. And so really cool, right, that you'd have a technology, no chemicals, very few moving parts. And so if the scaling factors work, could really game change the whole idea of carbon capture. Um, PARC, um, known for its um, fiber optic technology, um, one of the challenges with electric vehicles is that um, the batteries themselves um, are expensive. That's what everybody, right, that's what Elon Musk has been talking about, his factory is going to solve that problem and everything. But part of the reason that they're expensive is because they're 25 to 30 percent bigger than we need them to be because we don't understand much about the health of a battery. And what we measure today, the temperature, the state of charge, doesn't tell us much about the chemistry that's going on inside. And so we asked a question about battery control systems. Could we do better? And Park's answer to our challenge was, could you, with fiber optics, actually get inside the battery and measure the chemical changes going on in the battery? Could you measure the temperature, the strain, um, and be able to measure much more efficiently and completely what's going on in batteries? And so their initial results very, very interesting, and allows you some other benefits as well. You would be able to have sensors on your batteries and across your packs that wouldn't need to be separated. Um, you're inherently isolated from your high-low on your charging. So there's a lot of really cool technology going on, but Park was not thinking of themselves as a battery control company until we parsed this problem to them. It's very, very interesting. And my last one is the one that I didn't believe at first. Um, this is a Berkeley lab project. This is on the left-hand side a backpack that I've had on. It's, it weighs about 18 pounds today. Um, it's loaded up with all types of um, sensors and um, location equipment. It allows you to generate images by walking around, and those ones on the right are Im images generated by this technology, of both the actual inside of the building as well as its thermal envelope. One of the big challenges in energy efficiency and its analysis is it's very, very hard. You hire a bunch of engineers and they come in and they measure a lot of things. Most building infrastructure, there aren't blueprints for much, much of our, of our infrastructure. So how do you decide what should be installed, where it should be installed, where your biggest impact, what should the expectations be? It's, it's not trivial and it's not cheap. And so the whole idea that you could actually put something on and walk around building stock and get very, very accurate thermal and building images um, was very, very compelling to us. But I have to admit, the idea we were funding a backpack was, was I was like, really? Is this going to do anything? And literally in like six months, um, the program director comes in my office with his computer. He's like, you have to see this. And he's smiling. So, of course, I knew I was so wrong. Um, but it's been moving forward. Um, we had it at our summit um, this year showing, actually not quite, these images are brand new, uh, really great images. They took it over to our summit on the hill. We actually spend time in, you know, with Congress trying to help them understand what we do. Um, they, they had their own guard. Um, Congress was not comfortable, I don't understand why, that something that looked like this was walking around in the halls of Congress and might image things, so um, paranoid um, all around. But it's really been good fun um, to be able to have teams like this and to be proved wrong all the time um, and to walk that journey between the impossible to the, to the plausible, to the inevitable. And it's because of teams, it's because of people willing to take really big chances and every day at RPE is one big experiment. And so um, looking forward to, um, to chatting with you, meeting you, and continuing to partner um, with um, you know, oh, those of you in, here in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, where we've six projects, I believe, here in, uh, in Oregon as primes or, or subs, and uh, look forward to continuing the partnership. So thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Do we have any time for questions? I have to look. I'm not sure what I'm doing. We have time for questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Great. Uh, very inspiring speech. It's nice to know we've got a government that's helping us innovate. Um, just as a question out of the RPE, what percent uh, of your projects you know, get to, let's say, early commercialization stage, and are you trying to benchmark that to improve that success? Yeah, well, 
so two things. We're always working to improve it, and we, we actually have both our program directors and our tech-to-market team focused on not only the projects we have today, but as projects move forward, how do we help them? Um, the benchmarking, we track metrics. We track metrics, like I said, um, handoffs to next stage. We track first commercial sales. Uh, we have four, possibly a few more that are actually in commercial sales already. Uh, one in software for um, routing, uh, for grid management. One in um, silicon wafer technology and a couple of the flow batteries that are actually in commercial sales. Um, we will continue to track that metric because in that, my mind, that's all that matters. Um, but along the way, we're just only five years in, and you think about the way grant cycles work. Our first money, we had money in 2009 that probably didn't hit the street till 10. So you're really all in four years out from the, even those first grants. So we're just starting to get um, some of those types of traction. But I am very, very excited with the partnerships that are happening with larger companies. I think in energy as well, we have to recognize you need a big balance sheet for a lot of things to move forward. And so where and how do you find that becomes important. It might be partnerships and consortia of folks to move you forward. But yeah, we'll continue to, to track it and continue to ask folks, you know, do we have the right metrics? Uh, so there's a lot of inspiring oh, things sorry. coming out of RPE these days. Yep. Uh, given the three-year shelf life, to how, see mu you. <laughs> sorry about that. how much longer do you think we can look forward to your leadership here? Oh, you know... Well, the good thing about RPE is we seem to have survived several versions of backflips of our, of our program directors going in and out and tech to market and, uh, and all this. So the great thing about the agency is it can probably survive anything we can do to it. Um, but I've been at RPE three years. Um, I came in to do three-year assignment. Um, I'm acting now for two. We have a nominated director, Ellen Williams, um, from who was former BP, University of Maryland. And we're hopeful that the Senate will confirm her. And so she would come in and take over um, the leadership of the agency. Um, I've agreed to stay while we're in that process and, uh, and figure that out. Um, but actively, and my tech to market side as well, um, actually, if anyone's interested, I'm looking for a deputy of um, technology to market. Um, getting people to come to DC is not easy. Um, but you know something? RPE, and I, I, this, is, this is, you know, my personal experience, RPE is an amazing place, right? Three years reduces bureaucratic drag. Like, I'm not interested in something that's going to happen 10 years from now. I'm really interested in the here and now and what can we do to make it work. And um, every day is a little bit of an experiment. We try things very consciously and we stop doing them if they don't work. Um, we just changed our cost share for small businesses because we recognized that the way we were running it might have been a barrier to how they interact with us. We'll look at that. We'll get feedback from the world about whether that's working or not. So, um, so sometime reasonably soon, I will move on to something else. Um, but I'm really confident that as we bring in new leadership and, uh, and our new, new folks, we're going to continue to evolve because every, everything... Um, needs to be challenged, right? We had a conversation um, six months ago as RPE, and my first question to the team was, what would it take for us to not exist? Like, what would the world have to look like so that you didn't need an RPE? And some of the conversation was very much around how do we help create that? But we were also there saying, well, why do we do certain things that we've forgotten why we do them? Like, we did them for a reason. It would be like trying to say, I'm going to go ride the Tour de France, but I still have my training wheels on. It's like, oh, those can go now, right? So you continually have to challenge and evolve. And because we always have new eyes to the problem, um, we're going to continue to evolve and challenge what we do, which is really great as well. So urge you, if you get the idea that you would love to be a program director, a tech-to-market advisor, or in the leadership of ARPA-E, to come do it. It's awesome. Um, we run... Our office is one floor, it's glass and whiteboard paint, ceiling to floor. So some combination of a startup or a kindergarten, depending on your, <laughs> on any day in the office, but it's really, really fun. And so visit us or join us, and, uh, and we look forward to continuing to evolve. So thanks for the question. We had some over here, we got some down here. All right, Cheryl Byron McCann, uh, thank you for your comments. You work in a wonderful uh, candy store of technology, so thank you for all your effort. Uh, my question is, do you concern yourself at all with benchmarking what we're doing versus the rest of the world in terms of innovation and acceleration? 
or is it that the portfolio is so rich here in, in the U.S. that that's 100% of your focus? And the question is really kind of motivated by, from a global perspective, is there a way to reduce redundancy of yeah. effort? to really yeah, crack yeah. through some of these problems? No, it's a good question. Um, reducing redundancy and also accelerating efforts, right? Um, being a new small agency, we've limited how much we do beyond getting ourselves up running and heading forward. But, um, but we have spent a number of time chatting with other agencies. We get a lot of inbounds. People want to run ARPAs around the world. Um, the, model itself, um, the model itself is not easy to replicate. You need a very large, active innovation community. In many countries, that's, they just don't have enough people in research to do it. And you have to be very comfortable with failure, which we're barely comfortable with here in the U.S. And in many cultures, that doesn't go well. Um, and the idea that I'm going to tell a program director, do what you want, here, this crazy idea. So we've had a lot of talk about model. And, what, and whether or not our model's translatable. I think things about it are translatable, but, but de facto, not so much. But it's been a very interesting conversation. We've learned a ton about that. Um, we do talk a lot about what's going on in different parts of the world from markets, because my bigger idea is that we would take things that we've invented here and potentially leverage them faster, because energy is very local. So depending on your situation, right? The situation in Germany is different from France, is different from Japan, is different from China. And are there places where there are markets or test beds where the value proposition is going to be sufficient to get traction um, is going to happen, is, is available? So we spend a lot of time now thinking about it more from leverage future and less on exactly the innovation itself, because we've got, you know, we got a lot of awesome stuff here in the US, but are there places where it could be better grabbed onto from a first pass, I mean, and, and go forward? So hope that helps. Yeah. Cheryl Frank Klutcher with Inspired Life. First to plug, uh, you mentioned the ARPA, the annual ARPA Summit. Uh, I was able to go to that for the first time as a result of Oregon Best, David Kinney, thank you very much. Uh, and see that, and I think it's the best run conference in the world of its kind. So if you're in energy and have any interest at all, you need to get to that. That's, that's, no, that's thank you. excellent. Uh, but the question is, one of the things we learned there is that ARPA was all about, in, in, in my background in commercialization, we're all about high, re, uh, high reward, low risk. But ARPA was all about, it was made clear to us, high reward, high risk. If you actually work too much on your your, your grant proposal to show how it's low risk, it's the wrong direction. That's not what you're looking for. You're right. looking for those big payoffs and the things that normal commercialization venture partners wouldn't fund. How do you walk that line with something right. that's, uh, uh, that's there and still get to commercialization within three years? Uh, well, that's the piece. To getting to commercialization within three years is actually not our goal, right? What I want to do is get people to have a handoff at three years that gets them on the path to that end game, right? So in some cases, that might be, I mean, we do have people who after their three years are selling a product, right? I, I mentioned a couple of those. But in many cases, they're gonna need a, a test bed, right? In energy, often the issues, the market might be interested, but you are still way too risky, and legitimately so. I'm not sure I want, you know, a whole new widget on my grid that's gonna take it down if it fails, right? Without somebody testing it. Um, so the question about how and why do we find people who are willing to be partners to move it forward through its various stages is really the critical piece. So it might not be commercial, but it's on a path to commercialization. So in RPE's mind, technology to market is in very intentionally intended to imply a process. It's not intended to apply, uh, imply an outcome at the end of our projects. Um, and the way we do that is is to be out there engaged with people all the time asking the question, right? And sometimes your first market is not what you thought, right? So we have an, if we have um, an aspirational goal for getting rid of the rare earth components of magnets and motors so that we're not subject to the whole scarcity of, of resource issue for whatever reason it's caused. Well, ideally it's for electric vehicle motors and wind turbines. Well, the odds of a new magnet technology, first shot having a ready for the market EV motor, probably not so high. 
but what we did in that case was we actually took in and did a market survey ourselves of every single type of magnet you could ever possibly have imagined. So I guarantee you we know more about the magnet industry and its needs than anybody else right now who's not in it already because the idea was, well, depending on what people have for their property mix, they can potentially get in as a first market and then get cash to live another day, right? And so we try to help people think about first markets, even if the ultimate markets um, might, be, um, might be further out. It's always a tension because especially, you know, yes, the models are different. I want first markets to my ultimate energy market. A venture investor or a strategic investor might want something else. And we're pretty careful to try to have conversations about how are we going to manage those things. Um, I don't want to invest money in a team that cannot be distracted from their commercial outcome, right? That wouldn't be good for our, our investment and the other way around. So we, we try to work hard as people are coming together um, to say, are our interests close enough aligned that this is going to make sense? So it's, um, it's a blocking and tackling individual project kind of process, just like it is in business, right? All right, then. Thank you very much.